Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Like you said, my name is Nicholas, and, and I work for the OECD. As you know, the OECD is an international organization that was created in 1960. And it provides um, 35 member countries with a platform to share policy uh, experiences and um, evidence-based research. We provide um, mostly high-income countries with recommendations as to how they could devise better policies. I've joined the OECD a year ago now, and since then I've been um, working at introducing machine learning in economic analysis and forecast. I'm going to mostly talk about the latter today and present you with a proof of concept. Uh, why a proof of concept? Because um, I've devised an uh, original algorithmic approach to uh, macroeconomic forecasting. I've taken the exact same data that um, uh, traditional forecasters use, applied it to them, and sorry to, to kill the suspense before slide two, but it works really much better. Okay, we can skip this one maybe. Um, before I tell you about the method, I can give you a very quick words about uh, how economic forecasters do and why they're so fond of uh, parametric and linear models. Well, the, the first reason is that in, in, in economics, in general, um, uh, linear models provide a transparent bridge between theory and empirical work. Here is, for instance, uh, the example of the, uh, an equation that states there is a linear relation between uh, inflation and unemployment. You can take the equation from a textbook, plunge it into the data, calibrate the parameters, and okay, you've got a forecast for unemployment. Um, and the fact of specific, specifying a functional form is akin to understanding. There, is, there are um, easy connections between theory and, and, and quantification that makes the linear model so appealing to economists. The other reason is that um, basically any small variation can be easily approximated with linear models. But linear models are constrained where economic complexity is concerned. Um, the economy is characterized by multiple nonlinearities, multiple interactions between the variable, multiple discontinuities. Moreover, um, there is structural change, the fact that the economy is an ever-changing system. You can't rely on relations that are estimated in the 90s to forecast the GDP in the year 2010, of course. For instance, here is a good example of nonlinearities that couldn't be captured by the models they were using back then. You have the relationship between housing prices and the growth of the GDP uh, in the US between 1990 and 1915, I guess. And okay, so most of the distribution is linear, except for just a few points here on the right that happen to correspond to uh, the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, which is, as you know, uh, the, the financial crisis and the housing bubble. So the relationship can be linear, but only until uh, a given threshold that corresponds to a tipping point. Another important issue is, like I said, structural change. For instance, the chart here represents inflation in the US between, uh, I, say, I think, 1970 and the year 2010. And as you can see, at, um, around the dotted blue line, there is a dramatic change in the distribution. Um, the distribution of inflation changed, and also the distribution of inflation conditional to unemployment changed drastically. Why? Simply because the um, central bank implemented a new framework for monetary policy that did a tremendous job at taming inflation. This is a good example of structural change in the economy, but this is a very easy example because it's a textbook example. Working with machine learning, I'm interested by examples for which we don't have a theory already. And because that, that's somehow the most um, defining difference between machine learning and parametric statistics. When you do econometrics, parametric statistics, linear models, call them the way you want, you begin with a model, you begin with an idea of the reality you're trying to model, with hypotheses about the substance and the regularity of the data, and then you put it in the data, calibrate the parameters, and get a prediction. Machine learning is completely different. Machine learning is modeling without a model. Data comes first, theory comes next. 
Of course, the problem, like Michel said earlier, uh, is interpretability. When you use algorithms that can capture very complex models, uh, well, uh, it, they're more complex themselves and more complicated to interpret. So the problem can be thought of as a trade-off between simplicity uh, and accuracy. It's a bit simplistic, but okay, we can think it works like that. On the very uh, left of this continuum, there are linear models that we all know, OLS estimation, very simple, very clear, easy to interpret. You've got the betas. You can set the betas to the government, say, you know, that is the detrimental to unemployment and stuff like that. And on the, on the right of the continuum, you have neural networks that, bearing a few recent techniques to shed light on their functioning, are somehow black boxes. I'm contending that um, in the middle, all the tree-based approaches provide a very, uh, strike a very good balance between the two and are uh, a good starting point, at least, for us economists. So I, I, tell you about, I, I tell you a little about the, the methods I've developed, and that's called uh, adaptive trees, um, and, and then how it worked. Um, so adaptive trees are good at tackling nonlinearities and structural change. We, we skip the next two slides, because I, I'm surmising you know how um, regression trees work, right? Um, a quick word about how we do forecasting. We, train an algorithm on the past and predict the future. We're standing at uh, this green point here, say 2007 Q1, use all the data that comes before and predict the future. That's only to be clear. Um, why are uh, regression trees good at, uh, at dealing with nonlinearities? Because somehow their functioning um, emulates uh, a, a rational. Um, and they can, they can capture complex interactions between the variables which, which linear models do not. For instance, here, we have trained a regression tree, a simple regression tree, only one tree on the past. It's a stupid example. Um, and we've seen that when housing prices are very high, it can be either that, well, the economy is working very well, so people are richer, so they buy more houses, and given that the supply is inelastic, the prices are going up, which is very good. Or it can also be the signal that there is a housing bubble, for instance, if industrial production is not um, growing fast, which in this case would signal a recession. Um, i I I'd be more specific about um, structural change. Uh, which in the, um, in the uh, machine learning parlance is known as uh, uh, concept drift. Um, when I was working at first on this subject, I made an interesting um, uh, constatation. So, okay, on, on, on this schema you have the, the, the training set, which is the, tr the training window, the number of years of history you train the, the model on, okay? And I've realized that I, I had better performance when I, I used a very, very short training window, only five years of history to train the algorithm uh, because, because the economy is changing so fast. So even, even though I was reducing the uh, training set to only a fourth of, 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 of the, the, the example on the top of the graph, the 20 years, the results are, are better, which is a proof that there is structural change. Um, so like I said, uh, the economy is ever-changing, which implies that the near past is, of course, much more informative about uh, the near future than a more remote past. There may be sudden structural breaks, for instance, during crisis. You have a crisis, the distribution of every variable changes brutally, the conditional distributions of the variable change brutally, and all the relationships that you had learned become obsolete and uh, are uh, and history uh, is, is no longer a guide to predict the future. There can be also incremental structural change. Think of a, I don't know, new house building technology that would uh, make it easier to build house so the house supply becomes more elastic to the demand, which changes the relationship between the price and, and the wealth effects. So to tackle this structural change, I've, I, I've created a technique called uh, adaptive trees. The idea is to, well, first, it's based on uh, gradient-boosted trees. It's not uh, a radical innovation. It's an incremental innovation. I'm using gradient-boosted trees. And, and the idea is to give much more weight to the more recent observations so that when the gradient-boosted algorithm um, finds itself output to predicting the recent observations, 
it will give an ever increasing weight to them. Um, if you're familiar with the gradient boosting algorithm, I think it should make sense. Um, the general idea is to detect structural change by measuring how accurately the algorithm trained on the, on the past can predict the latest observations. And when the, the performance on the test set here uh, is not good at all, well, it signals uh, structural change. And then in that case, the algorithm will automatically give much more weight to the recent observations. It is somehow as if the, the, the size of the training window that we saw on the previous slide was automatically adapting. The training window is larger when there is not much structural change and it becomes much shorter when the economy is changing in its nature. So that's about the method. Maybe we have time for questions about it in, afterwards. Um, now let me tell you quick words about the results. So I've been comparing this method to um, official OECD forecast, two actually, one based on a model, on a linear model, and the other based on uh, economic intelligence, on expertise. Um, okay, quick word about the data. For each of the six uh, countries I'm working on, the J6 countries, I use a series of leading indicators such as uh, industrial production, housing prices, uh, number of car registrations, these kind of variables. And I'm trying to predict the growth of the GDP. Um, a last quick word about showing you the results about how we can measure the performance of a forecast. Of course, you have accuracy. How close are you to ground truth? But it's, from an economic point of view, it's also very interesting to measure directional accuracy, am I forecasting in the right direction or not? And lastly, turning point accuracy. When there is a turning point, am I rightly forecasting it? And where is no turning point, am I not forecasting a turning point? In the figures I show you, I'm only showing the um, improvement rates compared with the benchmark forecast. Okay, so this is... Um, these are the, the performance measured comparison between adaptive trees and the uh, OECD model-based forecast at two time horizon, M plus three, one quarter ahead and M plus six, uh, two quarters ahead. Um, as you can see, there is a consistent gain in performance, um, especially where turning points are, are, are concerned and, and at M plus six, the adaptive trees are uh, 2.3 times better at forecasting turning points at the expense of a slightly higher false alarm rate. And here is the chart of the, uh, the actual growth of the GDP in the UK. The forecast made three months in advance with adaptive trees in green and the forecast made by the OECD model in red. And you can see that well, it works much better. It works much better around turning points. But you're going to tell me, hey, dude, you're not really forecasting the crisis. Yeah, that's true, and that's kind of a big deal. But in this case, I did not include variables that could allow any kind of algorithm to forecast the crisis. There is no information about financial variable or uh, global economy variable. So if I had been predicting the crisis, it would have been mostly an, an error in the code uh, because that, that wasn't possible. But you can see here in the, in the case of the UK, the, the forecast is four times more um, performant than the uh, OECD model-based forecast to, to predict turning points. Another, another example here is the case of Japan. Japanese economy is very hard to predict, but once again, we have a much better performance around turning point and a much better fit to the actual um, GDP. Um, when dealing with uh, macroeconomic forecasts, it's always interesting to look at the distribution of error. Usually, economic forecasts have a left, okay, sorry, error here is defined as the, uh, the predicted variable minus the true value of the GDP growth. So usually, macroeconomic forecasts have a, a left, a fat left tail because it's always very hard to predict the crisis, which are sudden, which are brutal, and, and so usually there are many values, large errors on the left, so where the uh, 
actual value of the GDP growth is much lower than the predicted value of the GDP growth. You can see it's still the case a little with the adaptive trees, but much less than, we, than with the uh, OECD model-based forecast, which means that overall, over here in, in this graph, I, I pulled all the, the errors of the old uh, J6 countries I, I made a forecast on. And overall, the um, adaptive trees forecast works much better around crisis. Moreover, it is um, 3.5 times less biased than the OECD indicator model. Um, so now I'm displaying results of a comparison between the adaptive tree forecast and the expertise-based OECD forecast at one year ahead. And as you can see, even when comparing with um, expertise-based forecast, we have consistent uh, gain in performance, not in all countries, but overall. Um, the adaptive trees work much better than, than the uh, economic outlook forecast in the UK, in France, and in Japan. It's not the case in the US and Germany, but still, overall, it's twice better at forecasting turning points. Here is an example of the, the, the forecast in the case of France. Well, it's a, a counter example because one year ahead, the, 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 um, the adaptive trees is uh, the adaptive trees uh, using data that is uh, stemming from the crisis, and it thinks there is going to be a crisis a year ahead. So it makes sometimes big mistakes. But um, besides from from that, it captures turning point much better. A quick word about interpretability. Um, I said earlier that interpretability was uh, kind of a big deal, and um, you can you can imagine. F figure a situation, the OECD is going to, I don't know, the US Fed saying you are going to have a two percentage point drop in your GDP. Why? Because my computer says so. It doesn't work like that. And I said that um, tree-based approaches were a great solution in this case, mostly because we can compute feature contribution. Uh, this is not a widely shared notion, but it's really easy to do so. To give you a quick notion about how it works, um, when you are running a regression tree, you can compute the average value of the target variable in each of the nodes. And for instance here, if the, um, the average overall the population of observations in the first node is 0.9%, when I include, when I take into account the housing prices, the average on this node becomes 1.9%, which means that the contribution of housing prices is plus uh, 1%, etc., etc. And you can sum over the feature contributions over all the trees, and, and have an, as an output the, the feature contributions. So, so here, for instance, in the case of Italy, we can see that um, the, the, the tipping point at Q4 is well captured thanks to the contribution of household confidence, the red line on the bottom graph. Well, uh, in sort of conclusion, the, the adaptive trees has many strengths compared with uh, um, the, the, the models that are traditionally used by economic forecasters, um, including performance and interpretation. Um, so it works well for forecasting, but in general I contend that machine learning is a great tool to explore the complexity of the economy. Uh, the data-first approach may help shed light on uh, hidden patterns in the data, and, and there are many um, things to think about it from an epistemological point of view to see how this can be, uh, this can uh, yield a new articulation between theory and empirical work. There can be many other applications than uh, forecasts, including the analysis of economic policies, uh, economists, what economists do 90% of the time is to try and measure the, the impact of a policy um, because when you know the impact of a policy you can recommend policies and machine learning can also be used uh, uh, in this purpose. Thank you very much. We have uh, time for one or two questions.